When I first started my speaking business back in 2009, one of the people I reached out to for advice was Jess Pettit. At the time, yeah, you can clap for Jess. <laughs> At the time, Jess was speaking to colleges and universities all over the US, and we knew each other because we were both facilitators in a program called Leadership. I reached out to many people that year, and to be honest with you, my conversation was, with Jess was the only one I remember. Jeff, Jess has this impressive ability to be direct, honest, and real in a way that makes sense and is incredibly refreshing. When Jess isn't at NSA or mentoring new speakers, she does diversity, equity, and inclusion work. She's written curriculum for numer numerous colleges and universities and organizations, spoken for Mercedes-Benz, Phillips 66, the US Department of Defense, and the one she is most proud of, the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department. Yeah. Her audiences have included plumbers, probation officers, realtors, councils, medical librarians, fraternity and sorority members, first responders, hospital and palliative care doctors, and the list goes on. She's been doing diversity, education, diversity equity, and inclusion work long before Target started selling pride t-shirts. Today, Jess is gonna get real with us. She's gonna talk about cancel culture and how to cancel proof ourselves. Cancel culture refers to the practice of swift, swiftly withdrawing support or ostracizing people, brands, movies, or shows based on perceived offenses. While Jess is most known as a thought leader and expert in diversity and inclusion, she has also hosted and performed stand-up comedy in New York City. She's funny, y'all. When she's not traveling the country, she is spoiling her pug lab mix, Leo, and listening to Johnny, ba Johnny Cash cover bands in Eureka, California. Y'all, please give a warm NSA welcome to speaker, author, and CSP, Jess Pettit! Yeah! So where should one start this afternoon? <laughs> I'm gonna start at curiosity. Now, when Brian Walter asked me like two years ago, if you could speak to professional speakers about anything, what would you speak on? I immediately said cancel culture because this was never gonna happen. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. So it happened, and here we are. So I'm gonna, wrote, gonna write a new speech on probably the most important thing that I can share with each of you, which means I'm gonna do like dissertation level research, and then I can't be that smart on stage because you want me to be funny because we learned that being funny pays money. So does being smart. Cancel culture is something that we all need to pay attention to. And in case you need to leave early, the answer is curiosity. That's the answer. So now let me explain. My mantra is to do the best you can with what you've got some of the time. By doing the best you can with what you got some of the time, you, it means you're gonna try. Now in order to try, you're gonna potentially fail. That's very hard for me to reconcile. But luckily, I sheltered in place for the last two years with a philosophy professor and 1,200 square feet and three rescue dogs. So let me save you a philosophy class. <laughs> There's a philosopher named Hegel. What is Hegel's first name? Don't know, but <laughs> Hegel, is a philosopher. We're good there, right? Okay, let's keep going. So one of the things that Hegel talks about is a dialectic. And the idea of a dialectic is two things happen at the exact same time because they are dependent on each other. 
They have to occur together. You can't separate them. So trying and success, trying and failure, these things matter. When we start talking about curiosity, lack of curiosity is immediately present. As I take you through this journey today, I'm going to ask you to keep in mind what is the other thing? When you hear something, what is the other thing? If you can do that, I believe you can stay rooted in curiosity. Oftentimes we talk about respect. It's all about respect. But respect also comes with two things. Respect, for most of us as thought leaders, or as I like to say, just someone who makes leaders think, if you can afford it. <laughs> you can write that one down if you want, because it works. Most of us operate demanding respect for our authority. We are experts, and we want to be treated like experts. And we demand, if not feel entitled, to a sense of authority from you, and that needs to be respected. Simultaneously, some people are asking for respect from their humanity. And what I mean by that is, is they don't even get the privilege, I don't even get the privilege to be an expert or an authority because I'm just trying to be a human. I'm trying to get you to see my humanity. How to do that when you don't even know you're not doing that is through curiosity. Then your authority can happen. Two things can happen at once. Today, we're going to talk about cancel-proofing ourselves. Staying curious is what I mean when I say doing the best you can with what you got some of the time. Now, in my life, the first time I remember seeing this, and Gen Xers in the room, we're the geriatrics now, Gen Xers, I'm going to take you back to a very pivotal day in my life. But before I do that, those of you that are not Gen Xers, you can't Google this because it has been scrubbed from the internet. It does not exist. But this particular moment in time was one of the most pivotal moments when I was deciding what kind of woman I wanted to be. October 1992, I had a spiral perm and a 24-hour headgear. I know, so much better. Saturday Night Live, Sinead O'Connor was the musical guest. Sinead O'Connor tore up a picture of the Pope in a protest of how the Catholic Church was covering up child abuse. This has been scrubbed from the internet. You cannot find it. I asked my niece. <laughs> what you can find is a video from her rehearsal where she showed a picture of a child. Sinead O'Connor was 23 years old and chose the platform that she was going to be on on Saturday Night Live because of something she believed in. Some might say she was canceling the Pope. As an Irish Catholic, that's quite a statement. Monday, she was on Arsenio Hall. Arsenio Hall asked her about Frank Sinatra, because Frank Sinatra came out publicly and said she should never be allowed to make music again. Sinead O'Connor's response, this is when I knew what kind of woman I wanted to be. Sinead O'Connor said, I'm 23 years old. Frank Sinatra knows who I am? That's amazing. Two things can happen at once. I'm going to invite you, in the time that we have together, to understand that humanity and authority are something that you don't just get, because they are completely dependent on someone else validating and perceiving your own worth. But they are something that you can give. Now, when I talk about humanity or authority, some people in the room may not feel invited to this conversation. So, I am taking advantage of this platform 
Call me Sinead O'Connor if you need to. But I would like to invite certain groups of people into this conversation. Primarily white men. Welcome. I'm being serious. Don't get on stage. This is my turn. <laughs> white men, white gay men, and white women that like to consider ourselves one of the guys. Welcome to the conversation. And the reason why is that recently, as a white lady, I have heard that white men are now dealing with white, male, pale, frail, right, Staver? And stale. He's not stale. <laughs> male, pale, frail, and stale. For some of you, this is the first time in your life that these variables are making you lose work. Welcome to being objectified. Some of us have filled a slot. That is how we have built our speaking career. And that saddle time has made us such good speakers that sometimes we get work because of who we are and what our expertise is. I am often a diversity hire because what could possibly be offensive about a comedian with a microphone and an attitude? <laughs> I would like to invite you to use this moment in time. I get it, it's scary. I don't wanna make fun of this. It is scary to realize that you're being objectified and that people are making decisions about you at tables where you don't have any control. Decisions that you may or may not actually be able to make a viable business out of, out of things that you had no control over. What an amazing invitation to empathy. Can we use this as an example where we can build our businesses and be wildly successful without feeling like someone else is stealing our work? When we come to NSA, we talk about cooperation. I love that word. We talk about how we're competition, but there's so many ballrooms, it's fine. There are times in my career where I have been up against other diversity folks. There are times where I'm up against other white women. There are times where I'm up against other comedians. And then there are times where I'm like me or Dan Thurman. I mean, go Dan Thurman. Have you seen him speak? It's not about the competition if you are secure in this reality. There are times where my authority is discovered after I leave the space. I have walked off stage and my clients have called bureaus and been like, I had no idea. Excuse me, I pay good money for my website and my web guys here. That SEO is on purpose. But thank you for tokenizing me. In the meantime, I am gonna cash every single check. <laughs> Cancel proofing yourself is not just about surviving right now in this political climate. It's about existing in a way where you can be happy Frank Sinatra knows who you are. How are you using this platform, this space? What do you believe in enough that's gonna come up on the platform so that regardless of what happens, you're gonna do it? I like to say we need to be 100% responsible now, I know there are professional speakers who are marriage therapists, so I'm getting ready to tell one of your secrets. Marriage therapists have job security because they tell us that you're only 50% responsible. <laughs> they got work forever. What would happen? How would you change what comes out of your face, out of your thumbs, 
out of your keyboard if you were 100% responsible for it. I appreciate the applause, but I am a fallible human, and that is a high bar. So instead of 100% of the time, what about some of the time? Can we try to do it some of the time? When it's not some of the time that you're doing it, you're going to find out about it because you weren't doing it some of the time. That is actually how math works. So when someone tells you you were not doing it, your response is to go, you're right. Tell me more about it. Thank you. Take that feedback as an invitation to go do your own damn work. That is an invitation. And then every once in a while, occasionally, you're going to do the best you can with what you've got some of the time, even if you're being objectified. That is the balance between humanity and authority. And that is how you command respect, regardless of what happens. Now, I told you that I had to do some historical research because that is who I am. When we start talking about cancel culture, everyone told me that this is a new thing because we have computers in our pockets and it's just social media's fault. I disagree. I'm not saying that it helps, but I disagree. Monetizing humiliation is something a lot of us get off on. Ostracizing people is to help the people who aren't ostracized feel like they belong. As a diversity consultant, when I'm hired to help people be more inclusive, the first incredibly uncomfortable activity we do is that you need to first decide who are you consciously excluding. Now, those of us that went to like do good or liberal school are like, oh, I don't exclude anyone. There are not enough chairs in this room for everyone. You had to register, you're supposed to be wearing your name tag, and that might be checked at the door. We're excluding people from this space because being in this space is a privilege. Once you're in this space, are you being included? Spoiler alert, not everyone will answer yes. The first step of inclusion is deciding who you exclude. And when you are doing that, you will uncover who you are ostracizing, who you are humiliating, how you are ostracizing and humiliating those people. And this isn't new. Some of you may be familiar with the Extraordinary Popular Delusions book. It was written recently in the 1600s. <laughs> I say recently because I'm married to a philosopher. So, it's postmodern, I think, is the 1600s, if I get that right. I did not get that right. He's shaking his head no. When we started talking about cancel culture and I started doing research on this, I ran into tulip mania. Some of you may be familiar with this story, but in the 1600s, a tulip bulb was more valuable than gold or salt. It was punishable by death to mistreat a tulip bulb. Now, again, I'm in a room full of experts of every topic manageable, so somebody's like, I speak on that, and just... <laughs> So any landscaping or gardening experts in the audience, shut up for a second. I'm going to posit at the risk of offending those two people that we don't value tulip bulbs the same anymore. Can we agree on that? Has anyone marched out of the room in protest? I know I say a lot of controversial things, but it doesn't seem that we value tulip bulbs the way we used to. They're just not the same. It's almost like values change and evolve or something weird. I'm going to let that one sink in. 
As a historian, it is the change and evolution of those values that is our responsibility to figure out where we stand. Now, I would say that neutrality is not a stance. I would also say, thank you. I would also say that associations are businesses and businesses are corporations and we live in a capitalistic society where we like to pretend that neutrality is safe. I'm going to ask each individual one of you to decide what you stand for and remember that we collectively belong to this association. When I serve on national boards, we have raucous conversations and then eventually a vote is called. And when that vote is called, we attempt to be one voice. Sometimes that's harder than others. There are boards that I have quit because I cannot do the one voice thing because it went against my values. There are other times where my values were so strong that even as the one dissenting voice, I was able to change minds. What are you doing with your values? And can you be 100% responsible for them? Some of the time. Sometimes we call neutrality a lack of knowledge. You don't know. You don't know what you don't know. So of course you're neutral because you didn't know in the first place. Then you find out something that you didn't know you didn't know and now you know you don't know it. Well, now that you know you don't know it, what do you think about it? How do you feel about it? How does it filter through? <sighs> don't do that in Spanx. <laughs> now you know that you know something. What are you going to do with that? Tulip farmers, great example. Two things at once. We live in a small town where there is actually a tulip farm because of course I did small focus groups and one-on-one -on -one interviews <laughs> and uh, all the consultants got that. <laughs> tulip farmers sacrifice a third of their best crop every year. They chop the heads off as soon as they bloom so that all the energy can go back into the bulb and it can produce better flowers later. What would happen, just a suggestion, metaphorical, if you feel like you just got your head chopped off and you use it as an opportunity to build a better bulb? If we can begin to understand we are 100% responsible for what we say, we're curious. We can recognize problems that we don't experience, but they're still problems. Problems don't have to be your problem to be a problem. <laughs> many of us, many of us work for causes that are directly related to our life. Emerging speakers, one of the things you will hear over and over and over and over again is doesn't you climbed Mount Everest and got divorced and survived cancer. Great. What does that have to do with the audience? I just made somebody very mad because that's their one cheat. <laughs> you have to take your issues, your problems, your resilience, your ability and put it out there. Put it out there in a way that other people can see themselves in that story. That's why storytelling is compelling. That's what we're here for. What I'm going to ask, my slides went away, fantastic. What I'm going to ask is that in doing this process, you ride two horses at once. Two horses. Welcome to my Texas roots. I think it's worth 35 points in the app. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to ride two horses at once, and I'm going to challenge you that this is a reminder to myself. 
Two horses, same time. First horse is of ego. Second horse is of humility. We'll start at humility. A problem can exist that you're not speaking about. A problem can exist that you are not an expert on. A problem can exist you've never heard of and you have to look up how to pronounce. That doesn't mean that you don't get to listen to that person's problem. It doesn't make it less real because you don't know about it. You want to know something I know nothing about? Testicular cancer. Nothing. You know what I also don't know about? What am I going to look like when I get old? My parents died when I was young. I have no idea. I've been the oldest person in my family since I was 19. Some of you are like, oh, this makes so much more sense. Daddy issues. Got it. <laughs> Can you respect the fact you have something you need to learn? Can you be curious about that thing? Your curiosity is going to make you the best student. And you want to know what makes really good teachers? Students. I've been Zooming with them for two years without pay. The ego horse not only comes with automatic NSA membership, <laughs> it is also what you need to close the deal. It is from your ego horse that you write copy on your website. My website doesn't say, I'm kind of funny. I, I mean, I, there's a lot of diversity people out there. I'm like, you know, kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Your ego horse is not when you're like, um, what's your budget? Oh, actually, I don't have those skills. Yeah, I've never done that before. That's like too big of a scale for me for that check. No, your ego horse says, um, did you mean this year? Because I'm booked. Well, for you, I'll let it in, right? Ego horse, some of the time. Humility horse, some of the time. Use your friends to tell you when you have been on the wrong horse or when you have been on the right horse too long. This is why we talk about mastermind groups. Because mastermind groups are the only people that know so much about you with the exception of possibly bridesmaids, which is why I eloped. They are the only people that know you so well that they will tell you to switch horses and there is a more likelihood possibility chance that you will change horses. That amazing great idea you have that is being fueled by your ego that is dumb, is dumb. Tom Singer wanted to start a podcast. You don't even have the equipment. This is stupid. He did it anyway. And the reason what happened then, boy reasoning, he went against me telling him it was a dumb idea, so now it has to be the best podcast that's ever existed in the face of the world so that he can go, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> Mastermind groups. And humility is the other way around. When you need to be able to knock someone down a peg, your closest friends know when you need to get off the humility horse. We all know someone who needs to get back on the humility horse. I invite you to ride two horses at once. It is up to you to recover from having your head chopped off, or someone not liking your comment, or someone commenting on your comment, or surveys that didn't like it, or picked a one because they didn't read the directions. Ride two horses at once, ego and humility. Now, if you can do that, we're like basically done. Well, just a few minutes ago, you were like, what does cancel proof even mean? What is cancel culture? What is happening? Hopefully, by asking those questions, you're now familiar with what curiosity feels like. When you feel fear, when you worry, when you blow up my text or my Facebook comments with, are you going to say something? Curiosity 
is how one cancel proofs themselves. So, what do we do with that? I'm going to suggest, as I did at the beginning, to do the best you can with what you've got some of the time. Some of you are note takers. Some of you are needing some action items. Some of you need snacks. What is important to understand, and here's an example of both my ego and my humility horse. The first 10 years of my career, I used to tell people to never, ever, ever make judgments and assumptions. You're welcome to spell with me. What happens when we assume? Some of you are challenged by the spelling and the rest of you did great, covered it right up. Here's the deal, that's BS. More spelling, also known as a cussing filter, for the right price, that can be inserted. <laughs> when you make judgments and assumptions, it is not about not doing it. It is about recognizing that you do. We make judgments and assumptions to feel safe and to feel prepared. For some of us, safe actually means about livelihood and living and being recognized as a human, as a valued human. And prepared means knowing what to put on clothes, language, spanks, no spanks, shoes, no shoes, this camera, that camera, that's what that means. We make judgments and assumptions so we feel safe and prepared and it is our responsibility to know what we do and why we do what we do because what we do makes us feel safe and prepared. It's not about not making judgments and assumptions. It's about recognizing me too, we all do. Once we begin to notice the judgments and assumptions that we make that make us feel safe and prepared, that is when we are writing a story. We are writing a story about that situation or that person so that we know how to show up to that story or that person in a way that we might be woefully inaccurate. But we're going to enter feeling as safe and prepared as we possibly can. It is also the case that every single one of you have written a story about me what I'm going to do, and what I'm not going to do, and how this topic is going to work, and how is this going to flow, and how is this going to fit, and there's not a damn thing I can do about your story other than prove you right or wrong, and I don't even have control over that. But what I can do is pay attention to the story I write about you. I am fairly decent at this. Not awesome. If I can pay attention to the judgments and assumptions that I make about others, I am going to be wrong. I'm going to ask questions that I don't know the answers to because I want my story to be right. I am going to write a draft of the story where I consciously and curiously with generosity, vulnerability and authenticity I'm going to print that story out, triple space with extra wide margins. And I'm going to hand it over there. And I'm going to hope that it comes back bloody red. Because I consciously sought edits. If I do this for you over and over and over again, there is a possibility the payoff is that you are going to change your story about me. Because to be open and vulnerable and authentic and generous and curious and all these buzzwords that we use in our book titles, in order to do that, we have to actually acknowledge that we have no control over whether they're going to be right about us. But we do have control and responsibility about what we do to you. I'm going to write that story. I'm going to curiously seek edits. I'm going to print that story out triple space with extra wide margins. And then I'm going to shut up and wait because I've left room for edits. To be curious 
means that leaving room for edits is that I want to be better about the story I have about you. That's what leaving room for edits means. It doesn't mean hitting the bullseye at any point in time ever. It means you're going to try. And when I say try, I want to acknowledge that trying is exhausting. To be completely honest, trying is trying. It's like I'm a professional speaker. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Because trying to try is very trying, but what really sucks is when you don't even have enough motivation to try in the first place. You know what you do then? You can say it with me. Try to try. If you can lean in enough to actually try to try something, I'm going to see your attempt to try to try, even though you failed miserably. I saw you trying to try. I see you getting crusty and burnt out and really exhausted. And to be honest, that process is trying on others to watch. But I noticed you trying. And that's going to shift my story about you. This is not about nailing it. The joke here is cancel proofing yourself. Good luck. Or can you try? Can you be open enough to the possibility that something you said didn't come out right? Maybe it came out right for a third of the room. The other third of the room is not happy. And the middle third are looking for snacks. <laughs> can you try to try even when it's trying? My commitment to you is to do that the best I can with what I've got some of the time because it's better than nothing never. When we have the ability to be good enough now, that means that you're going to accept responsibility to do the best you can with what you've got some of the time. That's it. If we have not learned this by now, some things have changed and some things haven't. Being a historical scholar, we keep saying we're going to learn from history. We could start that at any point. <laughs> Feel free. It's not too soon. If the 1600s were 13 seconds ago, and 1992 was a millennia ago, I'm going to go ahead on a limb and say this is not about time. It is about time to do the best you can with what you've got some of the time. That is good enough now. What I challenge you to do is to stay in touch. That is a double dog dare. I'm going to ask you to stay in touch because none of you are really going to do this. If you do this, I will get a job. Any of you saying, well, actually, you have a job. That's called mansplaining. Even if you're a woman, if it starts with the word actually, maybe don't say that. I currently have job security because you will not do this. You will not stay curious. You will not be prepared for something you don't know. You're definitely not prepared for something you don't even know you don't know. 
please prove me wrong, competitive weirdos. <laughs> Do your own work. Be responsible for yourself. Use these new feelings that you might be having or these new understandings that you're experiencing to recognize this problem is new for you and not other people. Other people have been experiencing what you are experiencing right now for a long time. When you have some new finangled idea, know that somebody has been saying that idea for a long time. I like to use COVID as an example. My clients often send diversity, equity, and inclusion topics into committee or focus groups. This is how I pay my mortgage, so don't fix it too quickly, but it don't work. The first move I do as a consultant is ask for every consultant's report from the last 10 years beforehand. No one has read them. You know why? I also include jokes in my reports, and no one asks me about them. When COVID hit, it did not go into committee. Nobody checked a binder or did a survey. They did the best they could with what they had at that time, and it evolved and changed over time. Their businesses did, your business did, and my business did. Two things at the exact same time. Because you want to know what also happened? Somebody had an idea, and they started a business. And they're here taking off like a rocket. And they listen to us old people go, oh my god, where did everything go? And they're like, I don't know, but I'm cashing checks. That's what 2008 was for me. 2008, I had just gotten my CSP. Bunch of y'all walking around being like, oh, a recession, this is terrible. And I was like, mm, really? I'm uh, busy. Maybe I'm not allowed to tell anybody I'm busy. I'll keep it a secret. That secret is hard to keep when you belong to the National Speakers Association. I made a mastermind group so that I could grow my business because I was ashamed of my success. Because people I was supposed to be aspirational to were complaining about how bad their businesses were getting. Shh, I'm winning. Right now, some of you are winning. And I'm going to challenge you to remember the two horses thing because some of us aren't quite ready to hear about it. But we will be. I'm going to ask you, use this platform wisely. What do you believe in? Why do you believe in it? Why do the other people not believe the way you believe? What can you learn from them? I have job security because of us them. Get a pen. This is a little grammar lesson for you. My us is right. Therefore, them are wrong. But if I was them, I would look at us as a them. My us is someone else's them, just like someone, my them is someone else's us. Someone is making a hell of a lot of money off these tulip bulbs. I wanted to speak on cancel culture to this audience because we have access to more minds, more hearts, more people, more jobs, more organizations around the globe than I believe any audience I work with. Can we cancel-proof ourselves enough to do what we need to do because we believe in it and when it gets challenged, we can actually listen to the other side and that side and that side and that side and that side. I appreciate your applause. 
you might regret it. Because I'm going to ask you to listen as if you don't know the answer. I ask you to be curious. I want you to listen to them because they have something to teach you that you don't know you don't know. And if you can listen to them as if you are prepared for the gifts that you are about to get about the information you don't even know you don't even know, you are going to get a habit of being curious. And that curiosity is exactly how we're going to stay in business and cancel proof ourselves. Thank you. Thank you.